And this morning we're coming to chapter 24. If you were here last week, then you will immediately uh, note that we're skipping a chapter. We're skipping chapter 23. And uh, from this point on, we will be skipping a few. Um, I really plan to try to complete our studies of Genesis by the end of this church school year. And we have a few more chapters than we do weeks to work with, so that's going to be the plan. I'll try to at least give you some idea of what we skipped, and hopefully you'll uh, go ahead and read that on your own. Uh, But uh, chapter 23 is the account of the death of Sarah. Uh, She dies at the uh, ripe old age of 127 years old. Uh, And uh, the bulk of the chapter really details Abraham's negotiation with the uh, local um, um, prince who is Hittite, with, from whom he buys the cave that's called the cave at Machpelah, where Sarah is buried and eventually Abraham himself will be buried. Uh, and that is the only real estate that Abraham ever actually owned in Canaan uh, when he was alive. But of course, the entire region became the possession of his descendants at a later time. Uh, So anyway, as I read the chapter, it seemed to me that uh, this was one that we could probably bypass, and so I'm using that uh, executive privilege this morning to do so. Uh, Also, if you've been in the class, you know that we've been through a real ringer here lately. I don't know if you appreciate, uh, you know, what I go through. But uh, last week, the uh, offering of Isaac uh, on the mountain and that extremely difficult text. And of course, not too long before that, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. And, you know, I'm ready to come up for air a little bit. And so uh, this chapter today, I'm just going to tell you up front, I don't think there's any really deep theology in it. It's just a nice story. And uh, I think it's just worth going through for the pure uh, delight of the story itself. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, this is the account of the uh, um, re- getting uh, Rebecca, who is going to be the wife of Isaac. And so it's a, it's a great story. It's really the longest chapter, I believe, in the entire book of Genesis. And so uh, what I'm going to do, rather than read straight through it and then go back and comment straight through it, is take it out of a paragraph at a time, a little bit more of bite sizes. And uh, the story tells itself... I'm almost superfluous this morning. I'm just going to be the reader uh, and make a few little comments along the way. But really, it's just a lovely uh, account of God's providence fulfilling his promise that he had made to Abraham now in this remarkable way. And so I'm not going to look around here for any deep, uh, penetrating, uh, theological, stunning insights at all. But let's just enjoy it. It's a, it's a nice story, and, and uh, that'll be our plan. So uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin at uh, Genesis chapter 24, verse 1. Our Father, we're grateful for the privilege that you give to us of gathering here and of continuing to examine the drama of the unfolding story of the life of Abraham and of his son and of his son and these first generations of uh, patriarchs so that we have some idea what it means to say we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and that we can own that deity as our own and embrace you as our father and claim Christ as our brother and find that we are in that same great family of faith and rightly call ourselves the seed of Abraham. We pray that our education in these matters would enrich our appreciation of those deep facts and cause us to find in a new and and special way our place in this great family. We give you thanks for it now in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, so if you are using the Pew Bible, which I am, it's on page 19, and we'll be beginning at uh, verse 1, chapter 24. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had charge of all he had, Put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live, but will go to my country and to my kindred, and to get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. 
Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. We uh, skipped uh, a little short paragraph that's back at the end of chapter 22. I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to refer you to it. It's uh, just at the top of the previous page, which gives a little bit of information about what happened uh, with the rest of Abraham's family. Abraham had a brother, Nahor, who he left behind and who now has apparently migrated into the region of what we call Haran, kind of at the very crest of the so-called Fertile Crescent. And that seems to be where Nahor has lived, and he had a son, Bethuel, by his wife, Milcah, and then Bethuel had a daughter whose name was Rebekah. And they're all living out in that region, and we're told in those verses, verse 20 and following of chapter 22, that Abraham had been advised of that fact. So Abraham knew he had family back there, and now, of course, he is uh, interested in seeing his uh, beloved son uh, marry and that the uh, seed would continue, that uh, would fulfill the promise made to him. So uh, Abraham now, 140 years old, by the way, uh, Isaac himself is 40 years old at this time, so a little time has passed, uh, and uh, he calls his servant who is said to be his oldest of the house. We're never told who this servant is, never given his name in this chapter. Uh, The bulk of commentators uh, believe it's probably the same Eliezer who is mentioned back in chapter 15. And in fact, the text this morning that uh, Pastor Charles preached on mentions Eliezer of Damascus. This seems to have been uh, the uh, eldest servant in Abraham's family, and he was the heir apparent to Abraham's wealth. It was a common thing in the ancient world when a uh, prince was childless uh, that uh, the eldest slave would actually stand to inherit and would be uh, adopted in a sense as that, uh, into that status. And so uh, Abraham was whining, if you recall back in chapter 15, that Eliezer stood to uh, inherit all of his uh, goods. And at that point, God had renewed the promise to him that an, a child of his own body, of his own um, Marriage would uh, be the, the, the proper heir. So anyway, this is probably the same Eliezer who he calls, and he makes this interesting request that he put his hand under Abraham's thigh. Uh, and actually, if you don't mind me being uh, a little bit more direct here, this is actually a euphemism. It's highly likely that what Abraham actually was asking him to do, which was not uncommon, uh, not, I should say, unknown in the ancient Near East, was to put his hand on his genitals. Uh, This was to solemnize in the highest possible level an oath, an obligation, to put his hand at the point which is regarded as sort of the source of the life principle. To us, in our Western tradition, we're a little bit put off by that, you know. But uh, this is the ancient Near East. It's a very earthy culture, and uh, they would would have a much more sacramental kind of approach to life than we do. And some of those uh, behaviors and and so on would take on a rich meaning, and so... uh, there it is. Uh, anyway, this is, uh, this is the, uh, probably the, the little ritual that uh, Eliezer was required to undertake at this point, as if to say this is to impose on Eliezer at the highest possible level of obligation and dignity the, uh, the direction now that uh, Abraham was uh, giving to him. So he uh, tells him to, uh, to uh, undertake this oath, and the uh, particular instruction is that he must not find a wife from among the Canaanites. As you know, Abraham is living here in the uh, region of Canaan, surrounded, of course, by Canaanites. And uh, Abraham does not want to uh, have any of these to be the wife uh, uh, for Isaac. Um, Many people have tried to find in the Old Testament a kind of incipient racism, 
Uh, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day, and so I just am uh, going to seize an opportunity in passing to make a little comment at this point. Uh, that is really unfair to the Scriptures. You do find, certainly, prohibitions in the Old Testament against, for example, the children of Israel intermarrying with the surrounding nations. And even here, for Abraham to be sending back to his family and not wanting to have a marriage with someone of the surrounding tribes, it looks like it might be a little bit of racism, but it isn't. Uh, That's simply an unfair judgment of what's actually going on. Rather, what Abraham is doing is a very customary thing in the day. Namely, he's wanting for his son to marry within his extended family. Abraham himself had married, as you know, his half-sister. This was quite common, and it was not only practiced by Abraham and his family, but it was practiced rather broadly in the culture of the day. That was the first thing, probably, in Abraham's mind. But also, in addition to that, uh, he was concerned about the rampant idolatry and paganism that surrounded them and certainly wanted to hopefully protect his son from that sort of uh, vulnerability that comes when you would take as a spouse someone that's utterly uh, devoted to a different religious object than his own son. And he knows that his extended family, while they're not necessarily as single-hearted as Abraham himself is in the worship of the Lord, nevertheless, he knows they have some idea of that, probably from Abraham's influence itself. And so, and we see evidence of that later in the chapter. And so for all of those reasons, Abraham is simply following a custom and has some good prudential reasons for seeking a wife for his son from his own family, and I think that uh, is a much better explanation of what's uh, going on here. So, in any event, uh, the the uh, servant uh, willingly agrees to this uh, oath, takes this responsibility, but he's concerned. What if she doesn't want to come? <laughs> you know, kind of a practical consideration. What if I find the right person, but she likes it there, and uh, she wants to stay close to uh, her family? Should I take Isaac with me? And, and have the marriage uh, take place there. Of course, Abraham has a very negative response to that. Uh, and the reason is obvious. God has given him as an initial gift this land. Now, obviously, from the New Testament point of view, God has given Abraham ultimately the whole world. But the beginning of that great gift began in Canaan. And God had given Canaan to Abraham and to his descendants And so Abraham doesn't want to do anything to compromise his own conviction that this is where he must be, this is where his family must be, and so Isaac must have a family that's here, and this this, uh, prospective wife must come back here. That would be the only way this this promise could be rightly uh, fulfilled. So Abraham gives kind of an out clause uh, to to Eliezer, if the woman just will not come back, then you're released from the oath. But at the same time, Abraham is uh, quite convinced she will come. In fact, he says, God will send his angel in advance. Abraham knows that if God makes a promise, God's going to provide the means whereby the promise will be fulfilled. And so whatever is necessary to make this happen, God is going to be on the hook to to deliver, as it were, if we just simply are uh, responsible in in, uh, carrying out our aspect of the, um, the duty here. So... Uh, With that assurance, uh, the servant uh, begins this trip and takes the oath, and that brings us to verse 10. Uh, Verse 10, then and following. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all kinds of choice gifts from his master. And he set out and went to Aram Neharaim, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was toward evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I'm standing here by the spring of water, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink, And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. 
By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to your master. So, what to do? Eliezer shows up. He's in the right region. He's at the uh, city that's called the uh, Nahor City. The, the exact location of this uh, uh, city with the strange long name here uh, is not really known, but we infer from later texts in Genesis that it was probably uh, north, northern Syria. Uh, and uh, so it was not back in Ur of the Chaldees. He didn't have to go back that far, but was uh, in the region of, what's, uh, uh, of Haran and, and uh, other vicinities there. So uh, that's where he went back. He took ten of his master's camels. Of course, Abraham is extraordinarily wealthy. Uh, and uh, these camels are not just to uh, make a pretty postcard, you know. They're burdened down with all kinds of gifts, not only provisions for the journey, but all sorts of rich gifts which are going to be given to the family from whom this bride will be taken. This is, uh, this is a, a, a bride price, as it were. This is paying, and it was very common, of course, at the time, to pay the family richly and bestow gifts on them, as well as the, uh, uh, the uh, bride herself. And so these camels are carrying a goodly amount of uh, Abraham's wealth as an expression of, uh, of that particular cultural norm. And so uh, they go off, they come to this city, and now... Uh, Eliezer has the camels kneel down. Camels were trained to do that when they were young. Uh, this would make it a lot easier to load them up and unload them, of course, right by the well. Uh, and he was there in the evening. Uh, it was customary in that time for women to make the trip once in the morning, once in the evening to get water from the well, uh, which was outside the city typically. And uh, so he waits there, knowing that this is the likely place where he's going to have this little pageant of the, uh, you know, the prospective uh, eligible females in this community coming out. And uh, how do you, where do you go from here? You know, how exactly is he going to uh, do this? Well, he prays this prayer in which he's, as it were, relying on God's providence. He's kind of setting it up so that God and his providence would make the would clarify who the person is going to be. Um, and it really invites a question, you know, to what extent should we do that? Uh, to what extent can we say, now, look, God, uh, you know, if, if have me roll a three on the dice here, so that's, no, I'll do this and not that. To what extent can we kind of ask God to, as it were, tinker with the circumstances to show us the way? Which door is open? Which door is closed? Which way should we go? It comes perilously close to something that biblically we are prohibited from doing, namely testing God or putting God to the test. Uh, you know that when Jesus was up on top of the uh, temple and uh, you know Satan was uh, trying to induce him to uh, shift his loyalty from God to Satan, he said, well, look, why don't you do this? Why don't you jump off the temple and... Within a nanosecond, all of these angels will come and rescue you, and that'll be a big spectacular deal, so people will know you're the Messiah. And you know, kind of feeds that to Jesus. And Jesus responds, as you well know, Thou shalt not tempt, thou shalt not put the Lord thy God to the test. Uh, we are not called as, as people of faith to put ourselves in harm's way on the presumption that God's going to come and rescue us. You know, there's a great hazard in that. We're supposed to live sane lives and to put ourselves at risk, forcing God's hand, as it were, uh, is not really a smart thing to do, and it's not what we're called to do. And that's the kind of thing that Jesus expressly repudiates there. There is one point at where we are, in fact, given permission, indeed commanded, to put God to the test. Uh, the only one I'm aware of is uh, re referred to in Malachi, where we're told we may and, in fact, ought to put God to the test at the point of our giving, tithing. At that point, God says, if you put me to the test, I'll open the windows of heaven and bestow on you such a blessing that it's incalculable. But with the exception of that one point, we're not supposed to test God. Uh, what's Eliezer doing here? It's not quite a test. He's not putting himself in harm's way. But he is asking God to make it clear, and he's making a... Uh, kind of setting up a circumstance that would be pretty unusual. Uh, people have traveled and commented on this in this region would say, it wouldn't be unusual for uh, someone in the situation of Rebecca to willingly offer a cup of water to someone under the circumstances of uh, Eliezer. It would be highly unusual 
for her then to immediately turn around and say, oh, and I'll water your camels too, you know. That wouldn't be quite so uh, expected. Uh, so Eliezer is not setting something up that would just be almost predictable. Uh, it's going to be quite unpredictable uh, by the normal course of events that Rebecca would do this. Uh, camels, as you know, can suck up quite a bit of water. I, I don't, I'm not an expert on camels, but uh, they've been on this long trip through the desert, and this, is, this was no small thing, you know, for Rebecca to say, oh, I'll water those beasts too. She probably made 50 trips back and forth from the well to the trough, you know, and... and uh, so uh, this is, this is Eliezer is, is requesting something here which is a little bit out of the ordinary and hoping that that will make it clear. And, and uh, we, we need to be cautious when we try to read God's hand in circumstances. We need to watch for it, but we need to be cautious about becoming superstitious or almost looking for omens, that kind of thing. We're never called to that. But at the same time, there is a sense in which we watch for God's hand in the detail all the time of our lives, and there's a proper balance there, and it uh, seems that Eliezer has uh, some idea of that here. So, verse 15, he's just prayed. We learn later he's praying this silently. He prays this in his heart, he says later. Uh, then as he, you know, so if he prays the way I was taught to pray as a little kid, I, you close your eyes, you fold your hands, you bow your head, you pray. And then uh, Eliezer opened his eyes, looked up, and voila! Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebecca. You know, isn't that great? This is the great, this is the, 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 my favorite paragraph is this one right here. Who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, the girl was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me have a sip, uh, let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they finish drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. So here's this, isn't this a made-for-movies moment? Uh, It's just uh, great. Uh, So uh, Eliezer uh, prays this prayer and opens his eyes, and here comes this vision of loveliness from out of the city. Rebecca, uh, youthful and, uh, and uh, attractive, and so he observes her uh, and wonders if so, so quickly uh, this could be the one. You know, he has no reason to know either way, but he probably suspects it may be the case. And so uh, he observes her. Uh, she's very fair. She goes to the spring and uh, fills the jar. You notice it says she goes down. This is probably a little wadi, as it's called. Uh, where you go down some stone steps to what appears to be a spring rather than a well, uh, probably a little bubbling spring there at the, in, a, in a depressed uh, uh, area. So she goes down and fills this uh, water jug with water, of course. And as she's coming back up, then, uh, if you can picture these stone steps, uh, Eliezer goes to her and uh, asks if he can have a drink of water. Innocent little question, really not uncommon. Uh, this is not an unusual thing for him to be requesting at this point. And so she very cheerfully uh, is willing to consent to that and offers him a drink. And then, quite surprisingly, quite unexpectedly, but for the prayer that Eliezer had just prayed, she volunteers to water his camels, you know, which has just taken on a huge additional burden beyond uh, just giving him a little drink of water. Uh, Eliezer doesn't lift a finger to help her. Uh, He just stands back, and the Hebrew word that's used here, it's translated gazed at her, has the idea really of watched her with wonder. Uh, It's not just staring at her, you know, that's not the idea, but just uh, in a kind of quiet astonishment is the sense of the word, watches. Uh, Never saying a word, he's silent through this whole thing as she dutifully goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. 
floor, <laughs> filling up the thing in the trough. And you can picture this. I don't know how long it took, but I imagine it took quite a while. And uh, so he just watches this whole thing unfold. And, of course, you can imagine his own sense of joy that must have been uh, just bursting his heart as he tries to keep a poker face, you know, while this little uh, uh, venture is going on. So, uh, then verse 22. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels, which is quite a bit, and said, tell me whose daughter are you? Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of straw and fodder for a place to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness to, uh, toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's kin. Well, when the uh, camels finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring. Now, I don't know how you feel about nose rings. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not quite used to them yet, if you, if you, but uh, back in this culture, a nose ring had a very peculiar uh, significance. Uh, it was not just a, one of the standard ornaments that a woman might wear, like earrings or something else, but a nose ring actually was something like an engagement ring. It had that particular uh, significance to it ordinarily. It was a, it was a sign of betrothal. Uh, and so not every you know, young lady running around was wearing a nose ring, but it was kind of a, a sign to that effect. So when Eliezer, after she has uh, discharged this uh, rather uh, significant uh, uh, little project, pulls out and hands her a nose ring, uh, it did not take her more than about one-third of a second to figure out that something was up, you know. Uh, that this was not just a tip, a nice little, uh, you know, gesture, a quid pro quo for the fact that uh, uh, now uh, Rebecca had done this uh, nice uh, uh, favor for this traveling man, but this was much more significant. So her eyes kind of, you know, popped open a little bit when he gave her the nose ring and then gives her these ten bracelets. Uh, and this is all part of the, called, this, was, this was a very generous and, and rather rich uh, uh, gift that he's handing her at this point. And then he asks her the question, immediately inquires of her family. All of this, I mean, you know, Rebecca's not dumb. She knows almost immediately, you know, something of what's up. And uh, so he asks, you know, whose daughter are you? Is there room in your father's house? Uh, she gives her little family lineage here. Uh, as we've already reviewed, as she also extends initially a little hospitality. We have plenty of straw, fodder to spend the night, at which time now Eliezer prays, but this time out loud. Uh, clearly, this is an articulated prayer, not a prayer in his heart. He uh, bows his head and worships the Lord. This is such a lovely th scene that he hears this information. He has made this initial overture, as it were, to Rebecca and then prays in her hearing out loud, showing this great reverence for the God of the man that uh, Eliezer himself uh, serves uh, in these words. Blessed be Yahweh, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the way to my master's kin. Well, Rebecca, uh, you know, this is about as much as <laughs> she can handle. So the next paragraph then the girl ran, <laughs> you know, and uh, told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man to the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and he heard the words of his sister, uh, this, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the man, and there he was, standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Laban said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside when I prepared the house and a place for your camels? 
So the man came into the house, and Laban unloaded the camels and gave him straw and fodder for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. He said, speak on. So an uh, interesting little point here. Uh, you notice that Rebecca runs back. Now, these, these more wealthy families, uh, kind of clan uh, arrangements uh, in the ancient world, and to some degree to this day, uh, would live in separate households. In other words, there was a women's household. You may remember, uh, in fact, we'll see a little bit later, Sarah had her own tent. Uh, indeed, uh, Isaac will take Rebekah to his mother's tent. Sarah, of course, has died by now, but, but uh, that's this idea of the women, the wife having her own uh, residence, as it were, in these larger uh, communal sort of uh, arrangements was not uncommon. Uh, and so here, you notice that Rebecca goes running back. She doesn't go to her father, Bethuel. She doesn't go to her brother, Laban. She goes to her mother, <laughs> you know, because she knows uh, something of what's up, and that's the first person she wants to talk to uh, and report this, uh, this which, which has to, of course, in her mind, be something of a, of a wonderful, uh, exciting thing, whatever it might mean, which she hardly knows uh, yet. So she ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. We know that uh, uh, Laban has his father, Rebecca's father, is still alive, Bethuel, but for some reason Laban takes the uh, principal role here. Uh, commentators are just kind of perplexed about that. You've got a few theories floating around. Maybe Bethuel was not in good health. Uh, maybe uh, Laban had already begun to just assert himself. We know that he's a quite assertive personality. We learn that later in his dealings with Jacob. Uh, and even already we see a hint of it, although here he behaves in a perfectly appropriate way. There's really no hint of uh, anything less than, than uh, propriety on Laban's part. But for some reason or other, he's the guy that uh, sort of steps up to the plate and begins to uh, uh, take the lead in this conversation. So... Uh, Laban is the one who goes running out to the spring to find uh, this man standing there uh, with the camels. Uh, he was, Laban, of course, figured it all out when he saw the nose ring. Uh, you know, that, that immediately gave him a clue what was going on. The bracelets, the gifts, uh, the word from Rebecca herself, and so on. And so he goes out, and in a kind of uh, hospitable rebuke, very typical, uh, what are you doing standing out here? You know, it's like uh, we, we invited you three hours ago. Well, he hasn't even properly been invited yet, but it's just that sort of, uh, of um, uh, invitation that's extended to him. Uh, Come in, O oh, blessed of the Lord, and uh, why are you standing out here with your camels? And, and uh, we've already prepared a place for you. So uh, at that, uh, Eliezer follows Laban. They go to the house. It was very uh, uh, common when you were entertaining a visitor, a stranger, a traveler, not to ask the traveler questions, not to interrogate this person, try to get news, you know, of the outside world and so on, until you'd properly fed them, until you'd shown them hospitality uh, and given them every comfort and so on. Then it was considered appropriate to begin asking questions because that's the way they got news in that day was by, you know, talking to travelers who would come through. And so these were... Uh, these were conversations that were sometimes very much looked forward to. In this case, even more so. Uh, you can imagine that uh, there was a strong desire to ask Eliezer some questions, to begin inquiring a little bit more detail, but Laban, recognizing the, uh, the standards of the day, first is, puts a good meal in front of uh, Eliezer and bids him eat it without asking any further questions. Eliezer, however type A personality, you know, he's not going to eat. He's going to break convention at this point and say, nope, until I have given you my errand, until I've told you why I'm here and what this whole deal is about, I'm not going to eat a bite. And so this is, Eliezer is the one who's kind of stepping outside the box a little bit because of the uh, depth of concern he had to prosecute this task that had been given to him by his master, Abraham. And so, uh, so he's invited to speak on. So without having eaten yet, uh, we get this next paragraph. So he said, I'm Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master. 
and he's become wealthy. He's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female slaves and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore him a son in his old age, and he's given him all that he has. So Isaac is the heir of all of Abraham's wealth. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, to get a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom you walk will send his angel with you to make your way successful. You shall get a wife for my son from my kindred, from my father's house. Then you'll be free from my oath. Uh, uh, when you come to my kindred, even if they will not give her to you, you will be free from the oath. So you can tell that very faithfully now, Eliezer begins to report and recite the entire story from the beginning. Not uh, any hidden agendas here, no, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, duplicity or anything like that, but just a complete, full, open disclosure. Um, he first of all tells about how God has blessed Abraham it's very likely that they had some knowledge of Abraham. They, they're living about 200 miles apart right now. Uh, Haran would be uh, about that far, even a little less, really, from where Abraham is dwelling. And so it's highly likely that in the uh, general travels back and forth that people would undertake in that day, that they would have some idea that Abraham was doing all right. Uh, now, how much they knew, whether they knew about Isaac, whether they knew about uh, other, others of uh, uh, Abraham's adventures, we don't know. But now, is, as it were, official word. Uh, this is uh, all of the things that God has done, blessing Abraham very greatly. And the greatest blessing of all, of course, this son, who is now the heir of all of Abraham's wealth. And he then gives the uh, responsibility he has to come here uh, with this charge to find Isaac a wife. Verse 42, I came to the spring and said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make my way successful that I'm going, I'm standing here by the spring of water, let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I say, please give me a little water, uh, and who will say to me, drink and I'll draw for your camels also, let her be the one. So he's reporting here quite faithfully, of course, what we've already seen. Uh, Verse 45, before I had finished speaking in my heart, There was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. And she went down to the spring and drew. And I asked the question, please give me a drink. And she said, I'll do it and I'll draw for your camels as well. And she got the family tree and so on. Verse 48, then I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, If you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. So Eliezer, staying on task, uh, not to be uh, deterred here, says, okay, so that's the story. Uh, That's the test I laid out. Rebecca met the qualifications uh, you know, with, with delightful uh, completion. And so here I am. And so what's it going to be? Uh, Yes or no? And if it's no, then let me know, because I'm going to go find somebody else. I'm going to turn to the right and to the left. I'm not going to hang around. I'm on a quest. I'm on a mission, and I have to uh, fulfill that responsibility. So uh, so that's the he throws down the uh, gauntlet politely here at this point, seeking their uh, response. All right, verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either good or bad. Look, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Now, again, we don't have any strong sense that Laban, we don't know much about Bethuel uh, beyond the uh, passing reference here, uh, Laban later doesn't play very well. Uh, we know that he had you know, household idols. We know that he was not certainly single-hearted in his devotion to the God of Abraham. Here, at the same time, he acknowledges that God. Now, critical scholars have all kinds of ways of explaining this that I won't bother with, but, but it, it, it seems probably just at face value, the sense of what's going on is that Laban had some recognition of the God of Abraham. 
uh, and uh, appreciated the, uh, that deity, but probably was still polytheistic. He probably was not a, uh, you know, a great worshiper of the God of Abraham, but rather simply acknowledged him as one of a pantheon of deities out there. Didn't really have a very deep appreciation of just who this God was. But at this point, Eliezer is obviously reporting this all as within the providential care of the God of Abraham. And Laban is certainly not arguing the point and regards this then as, as ample evidence that God has been involved in this unfolding story and uh, recognizes it. So I don't want to attach too much significance to Laban's apparent um, kind of reverential respect for the deity here, and yet at the same time he probably had some idea of uh, Abraham's style of worship and, and so on. But be that as it may, uh, he's not prepared to dispute the point uh, and readily recognizes that this is uh, probably the destiny uh, for Rebekah, and uh, so acknowledges that. Then uh, verse 52, when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her mother, I'm sorry, gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they rose in the morning, he said, Send me back to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the girl remain with us for a while, at least ten days. After that she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me. Since the Lord has made my journey successful, let me go that I may go to my master. They said, We'll call the girl and ask her. So they called Rebecca, and they said to her, Will you go with this man? Meaning, go with him today. Uh, she said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse, along with Abraham's servant and his men, and they blessed Rebecca and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. And may your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Uh, So, of course, uh, uh, Eliezer has uh, poured out these great gifts, both on Rebekah and on her family, uh, which was very common, especially among wealthy families, to do such a thing. Uh, and then he wants to uh, turn right around and leave. He just arrived the, the previous day, you know. Uh, and it would have been very typical, very common, uh, to stay around a few days. In fact, this, uh, this opening parlay, stay here at least ten days, was an invitation to Eliezer to say, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that, maybe just one day. And then they'd negotiate for a while and wind up you know, a week or something like that. That's exactly what they expected because it, you know, he was exhausted from the trip and to just turn right around the next morning and head right back with no reprieve whatsoever was highly unusual. Plus, it was a little bit of an insult to Laban's household to decline this uh, offered hospitality. Uh, you know, it was, it was something that uh, he was uh, supposed to do, really, within the uh, expectations of the culture. And so all of this was a little bit awkward. But you can tell Eliezer is just kind of monomaniacal here. He is determined to accomplish his purpose. He doesn't want to eat till he's told it. And once he's got, you know, her in the bag, as it were, you know, he's ready for home. He does, he's just... He's so overjoyed at God's blessing. There is something delightful about Eliezer, uh, that he's willing to step out of the bounds two times now, risking you know, being misunderstood in the culture because he wants to obey uh, not only his master Abraham, but the God of his master and just be very devoted and single-hearted in that. There's a wonderful lesson there, I think, for all of us uh, to learn from Eliezer. At this point, so they ask Rebecca, you know, well, what do you think, uh, young lady? And she says, I'm ready to go. So there you go. Uh, and off they go. And now this last uh, lovely scene that uh, picks up at verse 62. Now, Isaac had come from Bir Laharoi. I didn't say that right. Bir Laharoi uh, and was settled in the Negev. Isaac had moved away some distance, not too far. Uh, he had his own wealth. He's 40 years old now. He has his own uh, operation, as it were, so he's some distance. You may recall this well was the very well that Hagar had come across the first time she was booted out 
of the family of Abraham, not with Ishmael, but before, you know, when she was uh, 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 sort of had preempted, as it were, um, uh, Sarah's position, or at least she thought she had. She was expulsed, and she got to this well, and she actually named it uh, the name Bir Laharoi, which means the Lord will see, or the Lord will see me. Uh, and it, that name stuck, and Isaac now actually moves to that region and uh, is, is there. And so uh, he's, and it's not too far, of course, from where Abraham himself was. So I, Isaac is there. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. Uh, the older translations actually say he went out to meditate, and the, the uh, Hebrew sense here really implies that. It's not just a little stroll, a little evening constitutional, you know, or even uh, business, uh, you know, agricultural concerns. He's just out there meditating, really the notion of prayerful, reflective evening meditation is very much kind of hanging in the, in the uh, sense of this, the connotation of it. Uh, he knows, of course, that Eliezer is on this mission. He knows that uh, the prospects are that Eliezer will be returning with his prospective uh, wife. And so Isaac is undoubtedly thinking in those terms, praying for their safe journey, all of these kinds of things you can well imagine were in, in Isaac's mind and heart. And he's now out in the evening and probably glancing across the horizon now and again just on the chance that uh, he may see uh, evidence of their return. Uh, verse 64 and, and so he looks up and saw them coming, and Rebecca looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel uh, for reasons of modesty. She's, uh, she sees him. She's been riding, of course, but now when she sees him out there, she jumps down from the camel, uh, and uh, she sneaks over to uh, Eliezer and says, Who is this man over there walking in the field to meet us? And uh, she probably suspects who it is, but she wants to confirm that. And so the servant said, it is my master, uh, Isaac. So she took her veil and covered herself, ancient Near Eastern custom, virtually a complete covering of her whole person there. Uh, and uh, the servant told Isaac all the things that had been done and how Isaac must have rejoiced. Can you imagine to see such evident and clear and distinct evidence that this is the one God has chosen for you. You know, just uh, what, a, what a delightful moment that was for him. Uh, and uh, so uh, Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. Sarah has been dead now for uh, about uh, three years. Yes, about three years. And... Uh, and the, the impression is that Isaac still missed her deeply, uh, still mourned to some degree for her. And, this, uh, uh, and he has his mother's tent, you know, probably in some ways for sentimental reasons. So he took Rebecca, she became his wife, and he loved her. Uh, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. What do we learn from this? We learn that God is a God of providence, and God cares for us, and that God likes a good story, you know, and that he's uh, filled the Bible with wonderful stories. I just want to read to you as a closing little paragraph, a thoughtful, got a short thoughtful letter from uh, a member of this class, uh, Rich McKin uh, Russell, thank you, Russell McKenzie, who uh, uh, sent this some time back, and it's a great little paragraph. I want to conclude on this. It's taken from uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary. And it's a, a little uh, summary of the significance of this marriage. And I'll close with this. Quote, This brilliant picture includes all the requisites of a perfect marriage. The sanction of parents, favor of God, domestic habits of the wife, her beauty, modest consent, kindness, and her successful hold on her husband's love, even while living in the same tent with her mother-in-law. <laughs> of course, Sarah wasn't there anymore, but that's still <laughs> the idea sticks. So, so uh, thank you, Russell, for that. And um, good comments. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, Father, we're grateful for the unfolding drama. We thank you for the way in which you provide and for the encouragement we gain that your way of providing for these of so many years past is a paradigm for the way that you provide for us. 
And all of us, as we think about our lives, can see those moments when you've brought in your providence and in your grace uh, such great gifts to us, surprised us with your goodness. We're grateful for it. We thank you for the lessons we learned here. Ask your continued blessing on us now. In the name of Christ. Amen.